Welcome to Wales Tech Week 2021. Thank you to our partners. Enjoy the session. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us um, on the very first day of Wales Tech Week for our session, Photonics in Action, um, how to keep growing and innovating. Um, so my name is Hazel Hung um, and I'm the Business Development Manager for CPE, the Centre for Photonics Expertise. Um, I'm delighted today to be joined um, by some of our industry partners who will be presenting during this session. We've got um, Professor Tony Davies from Thermetrics, um, Hugh Parry from Steam Bio. Um, we've also got a um, presentation from Spectrum Technologies. We've had some technical issues, which means they may not be able to join us, but um, let's see what happens during this session. Uh, hopefully John Davies and John Mowat will still be able to join us. Otherwise, I'll do my best to present their session. Um, I'm also joined today by my colleagues, Tom Johnson and uh, Mike Walker. Um, Tom Johnson will be speaking about our thin film coating facility um, at CPE and also uh, Mike Walker um, is supporting on the, um, the comments and Q&A for this session. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, please pop them into the comments, the, ch the chat box, um, and we'll answer them um, at the end of the session during the Q&A. Um, so, so rather than put them in, into the Q&A box itself, put it into the chat um, because I think there's, there's been some issues with that this morning. Um, so um, without further ado then, if Georgia could just share my, um, my presentation, please. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is um, following on from the theme of uh, the photonics cluster, yeah, the photonics, sorry, following on from the theme of photonics on the cluster stage today, um, we'll be explaining what um, CPE, the Centre for Photonics Expertise, um, is doing to support industry in Wales and how um, what we're doing um, and how we're working with our industry partners to drive innovation using photonics technologies. So I'll be providing a bit of um, an introduction and background to CPE. Um, then Tom will uh, be talking about our coating facilities and then I'll hand over to our industry partners to tell you about the exciting projects they've been working on. And then we'll finish with the Q&A. Uh, so CPE is a Pan Wales programme. It's funded by ERDF, the European Regional Development Fund, uh, through the Welsh Government to support um, university industry collaboration. Uh, we consist of uh, four university partners. Uh, Rex and Glyndor University um, are the lead partner who are based at the Optic Centre in St Asif. There's a lovely picture of it here on this, on this slide. Uh, we also have Aberystwyth University, Bang University um, and the University of South Wales. And we are funded to uh, boost business growth in Wales, specifically West Wales and the Valleys, by supporting um, product and process de development on projects that are specific to company needs. And you'll hear some great examples of projects later on in this session. Um, so here's a little bit of a background about us. Um, CP was launched in 2019 um, and we've worked with over 42 companies on the improvement of um, 60 products or processes. These projects are very much, um, they're very much company focused and a key part of the projects um, is also about developing collaborative working relationships between industry and academia that then might lead on to longer term collaborations beyond CPE. So a number of grants have been applied for um, that total to the value of um, £2 million and there's more coming on the horizon as well. Um, and three of the projects have led to um, KESS studentships, so funded um, PhD or master's studentships, um, as well as two um, net jobs being created in industry. Um, so you can see um, the, the impact of, of the growth on businesses through CPE. Um, also, this value here, the uh, £340,000, that uh, refers to uh, pledged in-kind investment in R&D. So this is the staff um, costs matched by our industrial collaborators. So every CP project requires matched in-kind contribution from company staff costs to the project. So there's no cash cost contribution um, to work with us. Um, and just to give you an idea of the average value of the project, that's about um, five to six thousand pounds in staff costs. Um, and finally, um, a major investment for CPEE um, was the installation of a brand new uh, £1.2 million thin film coating 
facility at the Optic Centre, um, and Tom will tell you a bit more later on. Um, so first, first of all, then, um, what is photonics? Um, photonics is a light-based technology. It involves the generation, detection, and manipulation of light. So the generation of light could be through lasers, LEDs, light bulbs, screens. Um, the detection of light could be through cameras, sensors, and solar cells. Um, and a good example of manipulation of light could be through the telecoms industry, where you get phone and internet signals through fiber optic cables. So photonics underpins our everyday lives. Um, and to illustrate that, let's try and think about what life would be without photonics. So let's strip photonics out of our lives. Um, and so here's a picture of a telephone. Um, this is what you could use to contact your family, your friends. You might have this phone in your house that's plugged into the wall. Um, or maybe you're lucky enough to have a mobile phone where you can send text messages to your friends. Um, on the sec second picture, we've got a, a screen. Um, this is a cathode ray tube TV. Um, or you might have a similar looking monitor uh, for your desktop PC, and, but it's pretty bulky and heavy. Um, if we want to use the internet, then signals are sent down copper wire cables where your phone line comes in. Um, it's a bit slow, but it works. Um, and then finally, if you want to keep warm, then we have to burn fuel like coal or gas. And this is pretty much life, uh, was pretty much what life was like back in the 90s. Um, and by the following decade, the digital age really began to grow exponentially, um, as well as the range of photonics technologies available. So let's bring photonics technologies back into our lives now. Um, mobile phones um, have become more than just a phone for us. You know, the smartphone has given us um, high definition touchscreen device that can take photos and videos. It's got multiple cameras and sensors, and it's become something that, you know, we rely on every day, um, every minute of every day. Photonics technology is packed into these phones that are just um, can be put in our pockets. Um, the screens that we're all watching on now are slim and lightweight compared with the old CRT technology to the point where you can now have a screen that covers an entire building. Um, fibre broadband is available to 95% of the UK, giving us internet speeds that are five or six times faster than um, the ADSL that uses your telephone line. Um, and then finally, for energy, about 40% of the UK's total electricity is produced from renew renewable energy sources, um, with 3 to 4% from solar, photo vo solar photovoltaics. And the solar power industry is growing year on year. Um, and this is an area relevant to the collaboration with Steam Bio, um, who you'll hear from later. Um, also, another of our industry partners, Graph Marine, will be presenting a showcase webinar later today at three o'clock on carbon reduction in the marine sector um, using photovoltaic cells. Um, so the next best big question is, you know, I've explained how photonics is woven into our lives today. So how is it relevant then to businesses? How is it relevant to industry? Um, and so what I'd like to say is that our focus at CPE isn't just in the photonics industry. Uh, we do support um, photonics companies, but they actually make up um, less than 25% of the companies we work with. Um, so our focus really is in using photonics technologies applied across all industries like the ones listed here, so manufacturing, life sciences, automotive, aerospace, and so on. Um, and this would be through photonic solutions like um, sensing and measurement, vision systems, laser processing, spectroscopy, thin film coatings. Um, and many of the solutions, photonic solutions, are now accessible and really low cost um, thanks to the, um, the advanced technologies of the smartphone. Um, so it's giving us um, low cost sensors for, for example, object detection, environmental se sensing, um, also cameras, for example, this eight megapixel camera um, here from Raspberry Pi. Um, 3D printers as well um, has come a long way. Um, they use UV lasers to produce high resolution and high accuracy parts for uh, prototype and production. Um, you can also use lasers for um, cutting and graving and also, um, for example, printed circuit boards like this Raspberry Pi example, but also on um, laser wire marking um, like um, with um, spectrum technologies. Um, and the final example here is um, near infrared spe spectroscopy that can be used to sort between different types of plastic at a recycling plant. Um, so we have 
six core areas of expertise at CPE uh, based on years of established research and facilities um, at the four universities. So we've got laser processing, film, film coatings, optical design and prototyping. Um, but rather than go into each one in, um, in detail, I want to instead um, put a slightly different context and explain how these are relevant to everyday applications. So our projects tend to fall into these main, uh, six main categories. Um, so with production aisle improvements, for example, um, we worked with a company called Welsh Slate. This image here you can see um, is a palette of very tightly packed roofing slates. Um, and it's a great example of an aut automated product counting system that was developed um, with Bangor University with a simple camera system. And they wrote the software as well to go with it um, to improve the um, accuracy compared with the, the previous sort of manually counting process. Um, in the area of quali quality control, um, we're working with companies looking at how to improve quality control man um, monitoring or manufactured parts using sensors or imaging systems, as well as um, inline monitoring systems to replace offline sample testing. Um, in the area of prototype development, we're working with um, several companies uh, developing new prototypes. So with Enviro365, we're using um, light-based sensors for environmental monitoring. Um, and thermetrics as well. Um, Tony will be able to tell you more about the, the project that we're working on um, with their uh, foot health monitoring device. Um, also in the area of prototype development, um, Diamond Centre Wales have worked with Bank University on laser engraving micron sized QR codes on diamonds. Um, they're also using uh, laser processing techniques with transcend packaging, looking at improvements to the paper straw um, manufacturing um, on the area of product process testing. We've been using spectroscopy techniques uh, with Mon Naturals, looking at um, the particle size and chemical composition of a wound healing balm from Mon Naturals. Um, also with Sure Chill, we've looked at the thermal imaging um, techniques um, to look at the efficiency of off-grid uh, refrigeration, which can be used not only for drinks, cooling, keeping drinks cool, but also um, vaccinations and, and blood as well. Um, and then for modeling and analysis, um, we're working with a company called Texion um, on the analysis of their product for parasite egg detection in livestock, so sheep and cows. Um, and we've improved the resolution of their imaging device by three times, which means that they can now move to a, a more AI powered count where they can look at the speciation of the eggs. Uh, and we also do a, an um, um, optical modeling using ray tracing uh, like ZMAX, which we've used on a number of projects. Um, so just to summarize then, um, CP projects are about um, combining the company's knowledge of their business and their industry with our knowledge um, at CPE within um, photonics of, of photonics based solutions. Um, and so this combined knowledge feeds into this, this hive of ideas. Um, and the R&D projects, um, they, they form in, in the blue here, they form the basis of the collaboration. Um, and, and you will be hearing the three case studies later on. And these three case studies, they feed into these, these growth drivers. So collaboration, innovation, um, new products and processes. And, and ultimately the goal of these CP projects is to support um, business growth. Um, and the growth, growth outcomes could be in cost savings or improved yield. Um, they also um, could be in um, developing new markets um, or, or feeding into grant applications beyond CPE, um, as well as um, um, new jobs as well. And so just going back then to our expertise um, at CPE, um, as well as having um, a team of academics with engineering backgrounds in various areas of photonics. Um, we also have state-of-the-art facilities at CPE. We have laser processing labs, spectroscopy systems, prototype facilities, um, as well as our flagship uh, facility, the thin film coatings facility. Um, so here to tell you about that is um, my colleague, Tom Johnson from Wrexham Glyndor University. Tom, over to you. Are you there, Tom? I am there. Can you can you hear me? Can you see oh, me? Yes, there we go. Yes. And you can hear me as well. 
Yeah. Or, can you or hear me? Good. Yes, I can hear you, Tom. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, okay, I'll start again. Uh, so my name's Tom. Uh, I head up the research team here at Wrexham Glinda University uh, for the CPE. Um, just a few uh, few minutes on my slides here, and that's just to explain to you uh, what our facilities are um, and how they work. Uh, I tried to keep it not too technical, um, but hopefully it should work for both those who understand photonics um, and those who don't. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. And I'll just uh, move on in my notes as well. Um, so at CP around Wrexham Glendale University, uh, we've got three main areas uh, that we look at with our equipment. That is optical analysis using the spectrophotometer, the thin film coatings uh, using our coating plant, uh, and environmental testing using our environmental uh, chamber. The spectrophotometer is mainly concerned with the measurement of reflection and transmission um, properties uh, of a material, normally glass, uh, as a function of its wavelength. So basically all it's doing is looking at a piece of glass and understanding what light bounces off that and what light uh, trans, um, transfers through it. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the, uh, the main part. Um, the thin film coating plant, uh, that's used for a, a wide range of applications, uh, and that can be from anything from protecting from scratches or environmental exposure um, to building up things like semiconductors. And the environmental chamber, that is used mainly for um, humidity and temperature control and to understand how a product works uh, either in a different environment or to actually put it through some environmental stress screening to make sure that it can withstand up to a certain specification. So we move on to the next slide. I just want to explain really what an optical thin film coating is. So the, uh, the purpose of any optical thin film coating is to modify the transmittance or reflectance properties uh, of the substrate material that you've put the coating onto. Uh, there are many different types uh, of coating that you can have. Uh, the one we're going to look at on the screen in a minute is anti-reflection, but there are also other ones, things like high reflection, which would be a mirror, Partial reflection, which is known as a beam splitter. Polarization, which means that only uh, one type of polarized light is going through. Uh, a filter to stop certain parts of uh, wavelengths heading through there. And you can also get a protection coating and conductive coatings as well. Let's move my note to second. So the optical coatings are constructed of thin layers, as you can see, uh, in our diagram here. We've got the substrate at the bottom in blue and then a thin coating on the top. Now, normally, uh, an incident ray of light would hit the substrate, bend a little and send a reflected uh, ray back out, which we would see normally, like for example, on your phone or an ATM uh, machine, um, as a reflection. Uh, this kind of coating, a single layer anti-reflection coating, what that does is, as you can see the incident light coming in, it reflects as we would normally get with a reflection on the glass. It's also refracted a little bit. The coating is then designed to be a specific distance apart, which means that when we hit the next boundary to go into our substrate, we get a second reflected lay, uh, ray, um, as well as a bit more refraction and the, the light going through. On the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see that because of the specific length, the two um, wavelengths uh, are slightly out. And when these are added together, it mounts to no light coming through because the, the sum of amplitudes uh, cancels each other out. So this is used basically to remove any reflection you get from the uh, substrate. Now this only works on this one, a specific wavelength, but you can build up these layers and you can have many tens of layers on there allowing you to do that at both a uh, much wider uh, wavelength and spectrum. If we move on to the next slide, you see a couple of, uh, a couple of different uses here for the thin film applications. So we know most people will know it really from things like uh, spectacles, where they will normally have a, um, an anti-reflection coating on, as well as a uh, protection coating, something getting scratched so much. 
Uh, it's also quite noticeable at well on things like uh, ATM screens. Uh, you can move all the way up to things like creating mirrors, and you'll find that in things like car headlights, uh, reflectors. And then if we go on to the next screen. Here this shows us uh, our new, very expensive, very lovely, very clever coating uh, machine. So as a side says, this is for uh, R&D production uh, of high density thin films. Uh, we use that for prototyping. Uh, and we don't do mass production, but we can help set up the processes to help you do mass production. It's a very large chamber, uh, 1350 millimeters, uh, and it's got two lovely electron beam deposition sources uh, and one thermal evaporator. The next part okay, is the plasma ion assisted deposition, uh, which is an RF plasma source uh, for dense non-shifting films and low temperature deposition. Uh, and then this is all controlled with integrated optical monitoring system. If we move on to the next slide, sorry. Okay, so that's the spectrophotometer. As we said at the beginning, the spectrophotometer measures the transmission, reflection, and absorbin absorbance of optical coatings. So this is normally used in conjunction with the, um, the thin film coating plant, so we can measure the coatings that we've created. Uh, it can measure from UVC to infrared, uh, so 175 nanometers to 3,300. Uh, and it can measure over wide, a very wide range of angles from zero to 80 degrees. And then last but not least, we've got our environmental chamber on the next slide. So as we said before, this is for controlling temperature and humidity testing. Uh, we could do from minus 70 to 150 uh, and from relative humidity of zero to 98%. Uh, this is, uh, for anyone who's familiar with it, it's able to do nearly all of the ISO and MIL standard tests uh, for defense, et cetera, that anyone could think of. Um, and it's a lovely piece of kit, this one. And I think that pretty much sums me up. Yeah, so thanks for that overview, Tom, um, of the, 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 the obstacle thin film coating facility. I think it's a great example of the types of um, uh, facilities that we have at CP that are available to companies. You know, they don't have to, um, pay for any of the um, access to the equipment. It, as I said before, it is based on uh, matched contribution in, in staff costs. So this is really a unique opportunity for businesses in, based in West Wales and the Valleys. Um, if we can um, move on now to, um, to a presentation from uh, Thermetrics from Professor Tony Davies. If so what do I want to go through this morning is basically a, a fairly early stage uh, project uh, with the CPE. Um, I'm also a professor of analytical science at the University of South Wales and during the lockdown period was introduced to Thermetrics and some of their needs and desires in the device called the Podium. The Podium um, is a technology to try and help out uh, patients with diabetic foot care issues. Um, it helps the healthcare professionals objectively assess the feet and we've heard all the stories about all the problems during the COVID that standard regular treatments are not happening it's only everybody's having to work on emergency only but the pony podium assesses the healthcare. Um, it shares images across the clinical communities which is very much uh, aligned with the nhs's digital health uh, initiatives so images can be taken in the community by uh, less skilled uh, clinical support people uh, and then be assessed by the more professional or the higher trained specialisms uh, without them having to go out into the community themselves. So this is very much looking at trying to get better health care for people who cannot attend the hospitals in this in current times, and also for going forward, because this is the direction everything's moving. So what is the problem? Well, there's a massive problem with diabetes. Everybody's probably heard about this. Uh, it is an epidemic. Uh, it's an epidemic that's going to kill an awful lot more people than COVID will do in the next five to 10 years. Um, 6.4 percent of all diabetes have a foot ulcer and this is what is likely to lead to their deaths because 34 percent of these need amputations that's a leg every 30 seconds 50 percent of the people who have these amputations will die within five years and if you think back to some of the the stories around cancer survival rates this means that people with diabetes and di developing diabetic foot ulcers have a worse survival chance um, than people with a lot of cancers okay so what does that mean? In the UK, about 90,000 people have diabetic foot ulcers as we speak. In the US, 8 million. 
Okay, total spend, diabetic foot in the UK, about a billion, 11 billion in the US. Foot-related lower limb amputations, 8,500 at between 40 to 100K in total costs to us who are funding the NHS in the UK per year. Okay, so this is the sort of numbers that we're looking at here. Not a great position to be in. So we move from diabetes, getting significantly worse development of the ulcers because diabetes essentially stops you feeling your feet. You get what they call neuropathy. So you don't know when you're injuring it. Person without diabetes can walk around, knows when the, the shoe's catching a bit, itching a bit, knows when they're developing sort of problems and tends to rest the foot themselves. People with diabetes with neuropathy don't realize they're doing that. So quite often you don't catch the fact you've got a problem until you actually start to develop the foot ulcers. This is not great. And people with neuropathy and with diabetic feet, they tend to only have appointments uh, every 12 months to get checked up. It's for way too long, so there needs to be a better way of dealing with this. So as we've mentioned, 8,500 amputations of one sort or another in 2019, that's one year's figures, okay? And if you look at the figures, that leads to around about 3,400 unnecessary deaths. Why is it unnecessary? So what is a billion pounds? What are we looking at now? So there's a very good Dutch scientist who's been looking at this, uh, Jaap van Netten. He looked at all of the different studies that were published globally and has come out with the figures that around 75% of all foot ulcers are actually preventable. The problem is the treatment intervals, the assessment intervals, and the fact that people don't know what is actually happening until it's too late, the ulcer has been developed. So what are we aiming the product at? What are we aiming the podium product at? So basically, let's try and pick up earlier signs of pathologies, of problems with the feet. And these do show up. They're there. They're there for people to pick up on and then to drive a treatment pathway, even if it's just rest, that will stop them developing into uh, foot ulcers, which they can then go septic and require operations and things like that. OK, so what we developed within Thermetrics was a product which could assess the feet for developing pathologies, developing inflammations, and then could continue to monitor those inflammations as a route to actually getting better treatment. What's happened in the deployments of this technology is that we've gone uh, within the healthcare professionals and they're finding more uses of this. So when originally they were thinking of preventing foot ulcers, that's fine, but you've got people who at that point have not really been flagged in the healthcare system. Yes, they're diabetics, but they're not going for regular foot checks. OK, what has been seen by the discussions with the healthcare professionals is there's a really good way of monitoring post intervention. So you've picked something up. Maybe you're treating it with cream. Are they working? So monitoring the feet as a part of the treatment pathway and then discussions in what the NHS calls multidisciplinary teams. These are multidisciplinary support teams that are made up of specialisms plus GPs plus diabetic nurses, etc. They get around and discuss individual patients. These standardized imaging will help in those discussions and get faster results to the patients that need it. And at the end of the day, looking at those statistics, we are going to be the patients. So what makes up the podium professional? Why is this of interest in the photonics environment? So what we see here is basically there's a device, this podium professional, that's the device that does the scanning. So that's where the imagery, the liquid crystal sheets gets it. You take using a tablet, you get the measurements directly from there. They come across here. You get foot photographs made, and these are standardized foot photographs. And um, some of our clinicians have come back and said, you know, the fact you can generate a standardized photograph is a huge step forward for us, rather than different people taking photographs with a mobile phone. These are then uploaded to a central server, and it's a central server which allows people then to communicate in groups offline. Very important during the, the, the thermetrics time, the fact that we can actually have uh, almost like Zoom calls of people discussing patients, discussing the treatment pathways, identifying when the treatment pathways aren't working, and then making communal decisions on how to improve the pathway without having to have the patient turn up in a hospital environment. So that is what makes up the podium professional. How does this come about? This has come about initially by discussions with podiatrists, but the expanding use of these systems has meant there was a lot more in input coming into what the device needs to do. So this comes back to the user requirements that were discussed with the CPE. The customer base has expanded into the NHS, private podiatry, care home settings, and other types of clinics. And as we move across 
this list, you'll see they actually have quite different requirements and quite different assessments of how the technology, uh, this, this foot measurement technology will work with them. Okay, so as we move it across, we've got a lot of different impacts coming in there. And the original designs were based on a limited case around the podiatrist, but the expanding business cases has mean, meant that there is far more required of the device. And that at the end of the day, we're talking about a device that interacts with you as a patient. Therefore, all of the medical device rules and regulations also come in as a requirements basis. So what has happened is since the company was originally founded, they developed this individual device. It works on nice photonics interaction, heat with liquid crystals, doing the sensing, changes in temperature of the feet are reflected in a full blown 2D scan of foot temperature, which is at much higher resolution than anything else uh, on the market space. But the interaction and the actual use of having the device in the community has meant there's more requirements being added all the time to what it needs to do. So. The company was lucky enough to get uh, an FQ grant to work with the University of South Wales as part of a Knowledge Exchange Innovation Fund. So this is industrial support. And as part of that industrial support, because the company is based here in Amakainen, um, is to look at whether or not the center, the CPE, our, uh, the Center for Photonics Expertise, can help out in some of the, the way the device is designed itself to meet some of these new requirements that we're having. So during the pandemic, everybody working from home essentially we looked at the, the requirements of the instrument the current instrument that's on the market against where it needs to be to meet the wider requirements that are coming in a number of different uh, versions of, a, of requirements for what we're calling podium 2.0 was drawn up um, there have already been patents filed around some of the the photonics aspects of it some of the different liquid crystal bounded sheets that are doing the temperature measurements and a technical uh, demonstrator design has been completed during lockdown so that's really good what's great is since last month we've now got access to the photonics laboratories at usw we can actually start putting this instruments together trying to build it up trying to see what works and what doesn't components are there and the ideas have gone forward to a kes2 uh, mres application which has been approved um, uh, within usw i think the final paperwork is with banger for that so that will be starting uh, in october so that's looking very good so what are we looking for? We're looking for an initial alpha technical prototype. Now, because it's a medical device, we obviously can't put that in front of patients, but we can assess the technology against the requirements. And the requirements come from surveys of patients and clients and customer bases uh, internationally, because these devices are also deployed into Australia, uh, over in the Americas and places like that. So there's a lot of feedback coming back on what the device does well and where they'd like to see uh, uh, improvements. And the improvements are what feeds the, the CPE project. So. KES2 MRES will hopefully commence in October. We'll get an alpha prototype available to be checked out. This will be reviewed by the board and the board's made up of clinicians. We've got surgeons on the board. We've got uh, uh, podiatrists and things like that. The technical prototype will be assessed. This will go through and also be assessed about class one or class two A medical device clarifications. Um, this will then be presented to the commercial partners and we will look to then take the KES2 MRES up to the next level and decide on whether we're going to go for an Innovate UK application, which will follow on from the, uh, the MRES. So that's in a nutshell what the podium is, where the podium wants to be and how CPE through their skills with the photonics and the, and the, and the, uh, the imagery and the image processing can help us moving this product forward for a Welsh company. The devices are built in Wales. Um, the components are built in Wales. It's a wonderful Welsh initiative that has, uh, has led to the products at the moment. And hopefully CPE can help the company make another step forward. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, that's a fantastic example of um, types of, of photonics technologies applied to, to healthcare. And you can see that, you know, it could make a huge difference to diabetic patients. So, so very best of luck um, with, with uh, Podium 2.0. Um, so I'm just going to um, pass you over then to our next speaker, um, Hugh Parry from Steam Bio, for him to tell you about all the projects that he's working on now. Right. Well, while you're loading that up, I'll just give an overview of the what I'm going to talk about. Um, here we are. Every little play, play I like plagiarizing other people's ideas. Shows. Um, I'd like to talk about support that CPE provided to, to me and the companies that I've, I'm involved with um, in some grant applications. So 
every little helps refers to the support that CP have provided. So if we could go to the first slide, I'll introduce myself. Um, Network New Europe is an innovation consultancy where building on my background, so over 25 years involvement, particularly in European grant funding, some UK funding, but uh, much more engagement with European funding model, because quite fr frankly, it's larger money and it can actually have more impact, in my opinion. Whilst at Network New Europe, uh, I wrote and then as a participant, I led the exploitation of a project that was called SteamBio. SteamBio was branded by the European Commission evaluators as a lighthouse project and um, that it was highly innovative in its outputs. As part of the exploitation work, I established SteamBio Limited midway through as a vehicle to take the results of that project forward. Uh, brought in other participants from that project with core knowledge and skill. Both of these businesses are registered in Colwyn Bay, North Wales. The purpose of Steam Bio is to produce innovative, clean burning, solid biofuel, water and biochemicals from various woody biomass. Doesn't matter what the woody biomass is. In Steam Bio project, we're using uh, stem wood, uh, thinnings, cuttings from pine, uh, from beech, olive pr prunings, vineyard prunings, and so forth. Um, so as I said, we set up Steam Bio Limited as a vehicle to take the project results forward into commercialization. So next slide, please. Um, we would then, during the delivery of the Steam Bio project, we were approached by people from Namibia at the European Biomass Conference and Exhibition where I was hosting a stand. The problem is massive. Bush encroachment in Namibia alone covers 45 million hectares. That's twice the size of the Great British Island. It creates societal, environmental and economic damage. That sounds very twee, but actually going out there and you see into the horizon the bush encroachment it takes away degrades the savanna so plants and productive it ceases to be productive and also the wild animals cannot roam and because they're trapped with it and that's an important economic aspect as well because ecotourism right across southern africa is a big growing sector albeit it's somewhat restricted at the moment through the pandemic the need for Steam Bio that was identified by the people in Namibia is it offered the potential to create value from the bush. By creating value from the bush, it then creates the incentive for people to clear the land. At the moment, there isn't an incentive to recover the land. It's too expensive. What's the return on investment? So therefore, this project creates an opportunity to generate value from the bush, a clean burning biofuel and water, which is very, very important out there, and chemicals. You're in, in a region with water shortage and persistent drought, which is actually getting worse through climate change. To do this, to prove it, we need to validate it at a larger scale than we have done already. At the moment, we had a prototype system processing 100 odd kilos an hour in southern Spain. We need to run the plant larger and for longer. We need to prove it technically, environmentally. We need to prove it with a market, both in industrial and domestic applications, and to produce, prove that it's economically viable. We have partners in southern Africa who are able to then take on the next stage and pull down commercial investment funding. But first, we need to validate. Next slide, please. That, then we come to the need. And it, like everything, it comes down to where's the money. Or as Tom Cruise said, show me the money. Commercial funding for this step is risk averse. We've proved it at a level, but it's still highly risky to go to the next stage. I know, I've tried. Then we come to grant funding. 
grant funding has been my bread and butter for the past 20 odd years but it's in getting increasingly competitive and i'll show you some numbers later as to how competitive grant funding is getting the applications need to be very very strongly aligned to the call you need to make sure everything is spot on it needs to be a strongly evidenced rationale for what's being done the business justification needs to be robust the work plan needs to be fully costed it needs to be really well written and then just as an extra thing you need to be lucky doesn't matter how perfect the bid is if you have an evaluator who doesn't like you you have no hope and, and i've had experience that trust me now we want our process to be powered by renewables namibia has got some of the best solar resource in the world one of the advantages of its location and it doesn't rain very much bush encroachment is very widespread but it's not always close to the grid you're talking across Africa as a whole, 80% of fuel is local firewood. So biomass is a very big, abundant resource, but it needs to be made into a usable format. Next slide, please. Now, where does CPE come into the story? Um, as I said, Namibia has got some fantastic uh, resource. It's very low density population very lovely country it's a wonderful country to visit i've only visited it once but for a short period of time now we looked at various uk and european funding opportunities and in that process we recognized and identified that we're looking at a renewable technology it would be highly inappropriate to go anywhere apart from renewable uh, power supply because of the abundant solar resource we wanted to make sure we had the PV requirements fully and in, ensured. In, now we contacted CPE. CPE did a full mapping of the PV availability across Namibia for us. They provided cost as op options. Now, one of the complications is that our process is a continuous process that lights are on 24 seven. It doesn't want to switch off at night. So unfortunately at night, we can't get any PV. So we needed to include within that the options of how to store the, back, the power, battery, or other renewables as part of the mix. We looked at various options, and the one funding opportunity that came through, which seemed very good for us, was the last call of Horizon 2020 of the EU Green New Deal. Uh, the call was announced in January 2020. 21 and CPE provided costing for the specific size and scale of unit that we needed for this application. So CPE provided two studies for us, one an initial one saying to us, yes, it's an economically good idea. They then provided costing for this uh, system that was scaled for this application, but with the recognition that going past this stage that there's a resource that we can call on to help us in the commercial implementation stage. Next slide, please. So what was the out outcome? As I said, grant funding is very, very competitive and getting more so. Uh, throughout the whole EU Green New Deal call, there are, I think there are about 13 funding areas. Uh, the specific application we targeted was accelerating the green transition and energy access partnership with Africa. In other words, green energy in Africa, for which there were 142 applications. And the ratio of that was they were only going to fund four projects, a maximum of four projects at total spend of 40 million euros. Our application was very well written. Without being arrogant, it was probably one of the best bids I've ever written. It was strong and it was very well evidenced. We had more evidence than we could put into the application. The CPA studies were a core part of this body of evidence. As I said, every little helps. We asked for 9.94 million euros in grant funding, of which Steam Bio uh, requested 950,000. 
we are in a leading role in this project we are leading it we are not the coordinator thanks to brexit but also we needed uh, a more established research center uh, from mainland europe to act as the coordinator the application scored 15 out of 15 it's a maximum people who are aware of eu grant funding recognize that that's a pretty good score i've never achieved that before next slide please so what's our plan where do we go from here yes grant funding is a core part of it but it's not all of it we're currently in what's called grant preparation phase as target start date is the 1st of september it's a three-year project it is a very detailed piece of work uh, the participants 15 partners are already actively discussing the work plan so that we start on the go there's no messing with this project there's no delay people are getting ready already to start on the 1st of september we will build within the first 12 months design and build a unit which will be shipped out to central namibia uh, the location identified and shared with uh, CPE in the costing of the plant. It will process continually 250 kilos an hour of chipped bush, over 70 tonnes a month, um, to produce five, over 500 tonnes of solid clean burning fuel, which will recover 250 cubic metres of water and biochemicals. It will enable the restoration of 80 hectares of land degraded importantly as part of this is the social and economic validation it's no longer a case does my technology work it's a case of proving that there is market acceptance out there in botswana in south africa and in namibia and to prove that the business case works so that we can then go into the important next phase pulling down and securing commercial investment this is the last stage for us this project before we go into full-scale production 30 units processing 10 tons an hour across southern africa will generate income for us of over 150 million euro and importantly it will clear 6,000 square kilometers of encroached land a massive area um, which is quite daunting it will make a big difference to millions of people's lives across southern africa which is quite impressive um, that's what we intend to do and as i said cpe they provided an important part of the information that we needed to gather on our journey on this thank you next slide please so thank you Giacomo. any questions please contact me Thank you. Thanks very much, Hugh. Um, wow, that's um, yeah, really exciting to listen to that. And I think um, it's um, a, sort of a, a, a great example of um, of how um, CPE can um, can support. You know, in in any way, this is this was um, uh, like you said, it was um, a, a, a desk based study um, utilizing the photovoltaics expertise at um, Aberystwyth University. Um, and just showing that how photonics as enabling um, technology can, ha can have can support companies um, like Hughes and, and um, yeah I'm really excited to see to to, to see what happens with this project because um, it looks like the impact of it could could be you know will be huge um, for people living in southern Africa um, right so on to the final presentation then um, we have had technical difficulties um, as I mentioned before. Um, so unfortunately you have me presenting um, the, the slides for, um, for Spectrum Technologies. Um, so if you could just share, thank you, Georgia. Um, so I'll try not to speak too long because I just uh, want to leave time for Q&A as well. Um, but yes, thank you very much to um, John Mowat and John Davies from Spectrum Technologies um, for preparing these slides um, for today. Um, uh, as I said, I will do my best to talk through them. Um, Spectrum Technologies uh, worked with um, 
Bank University on a CPU project looking at laser marking of medical instruments. Um, so just to give you a company overview then, um, Spectrum Technologies, um, they are a world leader in the design and manufacture of um, laser um, systems for uh, laser wire processing. Um, and these products can be found in um, across the aerospace um, defense um, and medical devices industry, um, among others. Um, it was originally formed in 89, 1989 as part of BAE Systems. Um, and the company um, developed a UV laser wire marking technology um, for specifically for the aerospace industry um, and has since become a global um, has since has become the global industry standard. So they supply um, virtually every major aircraft manufacturing facility around the world. So I think if you've been on a plane, then it will have um, wires that have been marked by uh, Spectrum Technologies lasers. Um, so yes, they've been used, used widely throughout the photonic sector for processing high performance electrical wires um, used also in the production of mobile phones. Um, laptops and also medical devices and aerospace products. Um, and recently the company has developed new technology for processing the wires using electrical motors and hybrid and electric um, drive vehicles. Um, so the company, um, they design and manufacture um, industrial laser systems. Um, they, the key products are um, a Capri UV laser wire and cable marking system for the aerospace industry um, and also laser wire stripping um, for um, using UV and infrared laser systems for the electronics, aerospace and medical sectors. Um, they have 50 employees um, in the UK, USA, uh, Mexico, India and China. Um, in the UK, they're in Wales, they are based um, based in Bridgend. I have visited their factory. It's, um, it's, 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 an, it's an impressive factory they've got there. So if you ever get a chance <laughs> to work with Spectrum Technologies, um, it's, it's, it's great to see. Um, so company goals and vision. Um, let me see. Uh, our goal is to be an innovating world leading technology company developing and providing laser technology solutions to problems in wire and cable processing and manufacturing. Um, yeah, they, they also um, are uh, very active in uh, research and development, I think, which is why, you know, they, they are, are a, a global leader um, in, in the markets that they, they, they serve. Um, so here's just an overview of the, the markets they serve. So the laser wire marking, marking equipment, um, is takes up 70% of their sales, predominantly in the aerospace industry, um, with 30% uh, in the laser wire stripping equipment um, in the electronic sector. Um, they also do um, um, equipment and service sales, which makes up 80-20 um, um, sort of rates, ratio split. Um, and as, as I said before, they are a global market leader. Uh, they export 95% of their sales um, to 60 plus countries countries across six continents. Um, wow, a thousand, more than a thousand wire markers installed and much, much more than a thousand wire strippers uh, installed as well. Um, sorry, this is all new to me as I'm reading it. So um, it's, it's um, very interesting for me as well. Um, so the business challenge then, um, Spectrum um, core business is in UV laser marking wires for the aerospace industry. Um, Next, followed by um, infrared lasers for wire marking and stripping in the electronics, medical and automotive sector. Um, and to grow the business, they need to identify potential markets outside the core business. So they've identified the medical market um, is an obvious sector to target um, and already utilizes laser technology for some applications. So um, since 2016, all class three medical devices that require direct part marking must include a unique uh, device identification code, UDI. Um, and from 2020, all class one, two and three devices require a UDI code. Uh, so the business challenge then uh, was the UDI mark must have the following characteristics um, for a medical device. So I think this is a, um, an example here in the image. So it has to, have a, has to be a permanent mark with high contrast um, and also sterilization resistance, so corrosion resistance. I think this is a key part 
um, and it has to be unaffected by passivation or other surface treatment. Um, so Spectrum Technologies first carried out this research around 2014 uh, into how to produce a laser marking system for this application. Um, and the research all pointed towards this one micron fiber laser. They carried out um, testing using um, high power infrared laser, um, but they failed uh, the sterilization process and um, there was corrosion. Um, also, um, they identified um, a UV laser as well, but again, they also failed the sterilization um, process. Um, so the project was basically put on hold um, until contact with CPE in 2019. Um, so CPE, uh, let me see. So yeah, the project, as they say here, is um, it's based on in-kind contributions. So the company had to match their time. Um, then there were no additional costs required. Um, and so for their particular project, they teamed up with Bang University, um, who um, are you know, experts in laser processing. Um, they have a suite of lasers um, of, of, of different types um, for to, to, to test um, on the spectrum, spectrum technologies, um, uh, sorry, to, to test on, on these medical devices. So the success, uh, the outcome of the project was that Bangor identified the correct laser source and parameters to achieve all the criteria for UDI marking. Um, so they've identified that the, the, the issue from the previous trials was that um, the pulse length was, was too long. And I'm, I'm guessing that um, Bangor University had uh, um, um, identified other lasers then um, that were, oh yes, here we go, two, shoots, two solutions, less than 10 nanoseconds fiber lasers or ultra fast systems did the job. Um, so we've got a picture here before sterilization and after sterilization. So you can see here is still still a high contrast image there with the UDI mark. Uh, so future plans then, um, they are now in progress of developing a laser mar marking system, class one specifically for UDI marking of medical devices. Um, they intend to use a short um, MOPA fiber laser um, rather than the ultra, ultra fast systems as uh, the costs are significantly different. Um, the MOPA laser is about 80% cheaper than ultra fast lasers. So that's, a, that's a huge driver. Um, and current market research points to companies developing ultra fast systems. So they intend to offer a much cheaper cost effective system to gain a foothold in the market. So thanks. Thanks for listening. Um, and thank you again to, to John Mowat and John Davies. Um, if, we, if you've got any questions for them, please pop them in the chat um, because I believe they are on the session um, in the audience. Um, just to, to summarize, sorry, I do realize that we're running over slightly. Um, that's just a quick slide about the qualifying criteria. Um, I won't go into it. I'll just um, finalize now just by saying that if you do want to chat to us um, if, to, to find out more, then um, myself and Carol will be happy to have a chat. Uh, we also have a booth, um, um, a virtual booth today, at, uh, today, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, so pop along and say hi. And if we're not there, then just drop us an email. Um, do go along to the Graph Marine session today at 3 p.m. Uh, where Carol will be talking with uh, Martin Lee. So I'll just stop my slides here just to see, what, see if we've got any questions to close the session. Thank you, Hazel. I'm uh, not sure how much time we've got left, but we'll try and cover as much as we can now. Um, we've got a quick question for Tony. Um, it's been asked, without funding and support, would it have been possible for Thermetrics to still make and develop the product? Um, this is uh, a, an advance of the existing product. So as, as it stands at the moment in the current financial climates and with COVID, the, the company would continue with the existing product with the uh, the issues that that one has in the market space. So um, it is a way with the funding that's available now to actually move and address some of the issues, for example, that the NHS have been throwing up with the deployments and the various uh, trusts, uh, both in the, in the northeast and the and the Northwest and the Southeast re, uh, regional trusts that are using the instruments. So, without without that investment, there was no way that the company, as a startup with you know basically seven and a half people working Nabakine, could have met uh, met the requirements there. 
thank you, Tony. Um, just very quickly for Hewitt Steam Bio as well. Um, yeah. Without the conference, uh, would the connection with Namibia have been as easy as you managed it? Um, no, it was um, identified. It was in Stockholm, and it was very useful. And it was. I'd never thought of any anything about that. And it, as a result of that, I was actually asked to go out there and give a. Uh, presentation which was quite bizarre because it was to an empty room but everyone it's blasted out on speakers through this uh, agricultural biomass show so uh, fascinating experience could I just go back to the previous thing about uh, the CP support though if I may um, I invested my time three or four months of my time at my cost which is quite a lot um, on the steam bio application and therefore the work that cpe provided on the study uh as an, an important building box was not something i could have afforded with my resource so it was useful and valuable thank you hugh great answer there thanks so very well. much everybody and um i think we'll have to close it there um as i said as i said before we are we do have a booth today so um i will close the session today thank you to all the speakers and um, for the audience for tuning in today and enjoy the rest of Wales Tech Week. <laughs>